The Bitcoin Standard Podcast brings you seminars from Saifedean.com, my independent online learning platform where you can take my online courses on the economics of Bitcoin and economics in the Austrian school tradition, join our two live weekly seminars, and read my books before they are published. Sign up now for access to the draft of my forthcoming economics textbook, Principles of Economics, and take five full online courses based on my books, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principles of Economics. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for CrowdHealth and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning every day's pair change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Rois Hanna. Rois manages the Twitter account for Coinbits app. Coinbits is one of the sponsors of this podcast. And their Twitter account has produced some quality memes and threads over the last few months. They've gotten pretty popular. And we wanted to get the man behind the account to make... Maybe it's your first uh, public appearance under your name, right? Uh, first time you get on a podcast, right? I think so. Well, I, I've gotten on a podcast before, but not in a Coinbits capacity. But yes, thank you, Safe. It's uh, such an honor to be here. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to have you. And um, we've really enjoyed the output that you've put out. I think uh, the amount of research that you've put into um, some of these threads is quite astounding. It's uh, it's much more rigorous than most uh, academics who look into these topics, it's definitely much more logical than what most academics uh, who look into these topics come up with. Um, in particular, we've had uh, great threads that you've made on uh, CPI and how the CPI is calculated, what is the definition of inflation, um, and the uh, uh, Federal Reserve, different bodies and their functions. And I look forward to getting into all of that uh, with you. But first, let's begin a little bit with your own uh, story. 
I should also say uh, you, you also host uh, the uh, Twitter spaces for Coinbits. And uh, you've definitely got a voice uh, for broadcasting. I think uh, you should uh, <laughs> consider doing this more and more. It's uh, It comes to you naturally. You have a very good uh, way of uh, steering conversation. And you've got also just the raw voice talent, which uh, I, I hope our listeners enjoy in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Safe. That's uh, that's way too kind. You know, for, first of all, I have to give credit where credit is due. A lot of um, my thinking on the subjects that I write about, and a lot of my thinking on Bitcoin and the economy in general, only really came from you. And, and maybe that's a good segue to to my background. So I am not an economist or um, uh, anything related to finance by training. I studied uh, I studied biology and chemistry, so I'm actually a scientist, a uh, fiat scientist by, by training. And uh, I, uh, like many normal people, um, hadn't heard of Bitcoin probably until 2017. I think 2017 was the first time I heard about Bitcoin. And, um, you know, I was going about my daily life, trying to make ends meet, taking care of my family, like, you know, most most people do, and uh, my idea of saving prior to Bitcoin, prior to reading the Bitcoin standard, was simply my four hundred one k. And you know, I spent what I spent, and whatever I was able to save, I was able to save, and never really gave it any thought. And uh, I, you know, I heard about Bitcoin in twenty seventeen. Didn't initially get Bitcoin. I ended up uh, down the altcoin. Uh, rabbit hole for a few months, um, as you know, the, the run up in the late 2017 time time frame was happening, and I won't mention which uh, which embarrassing cryptocurrency, quote unquote, cryptocurrency I uh, I ended up uh, starting out with. But the meme, I'll, I'll give you guys some hints. So the meme was it was going to 589 at the time, and it was the next Bitcoin, and it was the Bitcoin for banks. Um, and you know, I, you get sucked up into these narratives, and you know, I watched it go all the way up and crash all the way back down. And it was probably in the beginning of 2018 where I started to like try to think about this more realistically. What is Bitcoin? And I saw that everything else that wasn't Bitcoin crashed severely, went back to probably where it started in the initial run-up. Bitcoin didn't. And so I'm completely oblivious to this. I don't know anything about money. I don't know what Bitcoin is. I don't know what Bitcoin is trying to be. I don't even understand what cryptocurrency is. It's just I got this cool thing that I thought number would go up on. And then I realized, hey, Bitcoin's different. What's different about it? And I am extremely lucky, I think, to have landed in that time frame, early 2018, to be curious about it. Because as soon as I had that question, why is Bitcoin different? I went on Amazon. I like to read. And I typed in Bitcoin. And the algorithm was kind enough to recommend to me <laughs> the Bitcoin standard by Safedine. And it was, you know, had rave reviews. I'm like, all right, this sounds like it could be a topic that I'm interested in learning more about. And I get the book. And I initially, I, I you know, had long a long commute to work at the time. And I, so I listened to, to audiobooks and podcasts um, frequently. And so I got the Audible version. And I listened to it once. And it took me about five days worth of commute, so about a week's work to listen to it back and forth on the way home and back. And I was blown away because I think, and this kind of goes into the inspiration for some of the threats, what you did save with the Bitcoin standard is you really explain a topic of money well. And most people, where I was in 2017, 2018, had never really given any thought to the topic of money unless you are in Argentina or Turkey where you've suffered from you know hyperinflations and you have to have some understanding of what money is. But here, growing up in the US, never even given any thought, never even thought to think, what is money? And as soon as that light bulb went off, I mean, it's all downhill from there. It immediately becomes clear why Bitcoin is different and immediately becomes clear why all the cryptos are going to fail because there can only be one money. There only needs to be one money. And so that was the start of my journey. That was the start of my rabbit hole. And, uh, you know, the, the light bulb that you've turned on for me has shifted my life so dramatically as anybody who has read the Bitcoin standard can probably attest to you. And, and you know, there's no going back. It's it's uh, it's like that meme where, you know, the, the girl is blind and then all of a sudden her eyes are open. That's that's literally what the Bitcoin standard did for me personally and I think for, for a lot of people. So uh, credit where credit is due. Thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Very kind of you. Uh, I, th I have to say, I think uh, one thing that I had that, that I enjoy about uh, hearing stories about uh, the Bitcoin standard is that I think there's a very large number of people who are the kind of people just like you, you know, when they 
get curious about something, they go on Amazon and they look for a book and they sit down and they read a book. And I think this is a very low time preference uh, kind of person, you know, uh, generally, um, there are a lot of easier, faster, quicker ways of uh, getting your fix. Like you could go on YouTube and find uh, some guy with, uh, you know, with a fat flashy YouTube video and uh, strange facial expressions who will explain all Bitcoin for you in three minutes or in seven minutes or something like that. And, um, you know, you could uh, <laughs> you could even do the much stupider thing, which is uh, go on uh, the, some of these horrible propaganda rags like The Economist or The Financial Times and listen to the semi-literate uh, journalists who work there try and explain to you why Bitcoin is uh, such a doomed scam and why you should continue to invest in the um, system, in, in the monetary system that pays their bills to propagandize for it. Um, and it, it, this, I think, is the most common thing. Like in general, particularly um, in universities, I, I remember when I was at university and until today when I interact with, when I have the misfortune of interacting with the university people, it's all basically canned lines that they got from reading The Economist and The Financial Times and The New York Times and The Wall Street Journal. And it's always, um, you know, uh, the, the same talking points, which you're very familiar with, which is uh, basically people don't look into Bitcoin. They don't read anything that requires more than 20 minutes of work. They just get, uh, the, they have this idea that, you know, I'm a busy person. I have a lot of things going on in my life. And I'm uh, a smart person and I'm an educated person. So I outsource my thinking to all of these geniuses at The Economist and the Financial Times who will prepare, you know, a brief articles for me that will snarkily dismiss all of this new nonsense and um, make me educated and aware of why this thing doesn't work. So the, you get these exact same kind of uh, canned lines from all of these people, which is, um, they got the, which which they get from the Financial Times or these magazines, and it's always the same talking points. Like, well, there's nothing to guarantee that there's no authority behind it. So clearly, the value is going to crash to zero at some point, and um, you know, the environmental cost is too high. Uh, it's too volatile. It's uh, going to crash. It's too slow. It can't scale. Um, uh, some new blockchain technology might be useful, but Bitcoin is not very useful. And it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's a trap. And in a sense, it's just punishment. I, like if you outsource your thinking to these kind of uh, thought substitutes, these kind of um, shortcuts to intelligent analysis, um, it works most of the time, you know, for many things it works like, yeah, it gives you enough knowledge uh, to know what you need to know about certain things. And in particular, it works in things that are relevant for you. So, you know, these people uh, will develop uh, a new, uh, uh, an, an, uh, somewhat of an understanding of the politics of Brazil or Indonesia or some random country because they read uh, The Economist on it. You know, they, they read five minutes of The Economist once a month on Brazilian politics. And so then they go around pontificating about Brazilian politics, which works, you know, for the purpose that these things are, which is, you know, you go to dinner parties and uh, you express the opinion of The Economist to other people who read The Economist and they all think, oh, wow, this guy's intelligent. In a sense, The Economist is a lifestyle mag. It's a, it's not an educational mag. It's a, it's it's like GQ for ugly people, basically, uh, where you just uh, develop your, uh, you know, you're told what to think. You're told the fashions. You're told about the correct viewpoint about what's going on in Indonesia or Egypt or Brazil. And you repeat it at a dinner party. And if you repeat the right thing that The Economist says, then you're educated and you're cool at the dinner party or at the office uh, cooler, at the water cooler conversation. You know, you're, uh, you're the educated guy at the office who reads The Economist and you all nod at each other because you're all educated about it. And so it works in that regard as a kind of lifestyle mag. But then sometimes you get to something that's actually relevant to your life. And that's uh, something like Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, I... I speak from experience. I know that a lot of my colleagues when I was at university in Lebanon had this kind of perspective. You know, when I try and discuss Bitcoin with them, they are <laughs> the kind of people who would read The Economist and The Financial Times and they'd come back at me 
with these kind of responses and these kind of snarky dismissal or oh yeah ah oh, bitcoin you're still into that ah you know that it's uh, uh, uh it's it's dying you know it's uh, crashed and uh, it's not recovering and it's bad and then look how that worked out uh, their central bank is gone to zero basically their national currency has gone to zero their bank account has gone to zero and it's uh, it's a really expensive thing to try and take these shortcuts when it comes to thinking. This kind of uh, uh, high time preference way of, yeah, I'm just going to go by these propaganda outlets and to go by what they tell me. Um, yeah, it works when something doesn't affect your life, but when it does affect your life, it can be a very, very, very expensive mistake. And there's a smaller, much smaller group of people that will not go to these magazines, will actually go and buy a book and will sit down and read a whole book about it. And I'm very happy that my book came out because a lot of these people, you know, so many of them are just not, are, uh, usually would not have been into Bitcoin, would not have been into Austrian economics, would not have been into libertarianism, wouldn't have been into any of these kind of uh, usual, um, I'd say, funnels that bring people into Bitcoin. But they're into reading. They're into forming sophisticated opinions after being exposed to um, ideas. And they're into, you know, sitting down for 10, 15 hours and getting a whole book finished rather than just uh, skimming through um, a few magazines uh, while reading articles about things that don't matter to them. And it, it, it makes me very happy that a lot of those people end up uh, getting Bitcoin because of uh, my book. So it's always it's always a pleasure to hear this thank you <laughs> yeah no problem i mean i think you you had so many nuggets of information there that is you know it's a topic in a rabbit hole on on its own you know the the the, the sad part is it's a it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way it's, it's a very cyclical thing people aren't used to thinking adversarially um, at least people that grew up in a semi-comfortable life that don't grow up in you know in, in places where you know, you have open distrust of the government as a way of life, right? And that's something that I think coming from the Middle East um, is is more normal to me than, you know, uh, people who grew up in the U.S. their entire lives, right? And so uh, I was 11 years old when my family moved to the U.S. And so, it you know, <laughs> we had a democracy in Egypt where, you know, the, the president who happened to get overthrown, right, violently was winning the popular vote by 98 percent every time there was an election right and so you know you grow up and and you watch that happen and distrust in government distrust in authority becomes a natural um uh, you know part of who you know who you are and what life is for and so you have that natural distrust and i think i'm lucky to have born been born into that but i think for people who don't people who generally grow up in the western civilization who don't have that distrust who don't have you know the just natural tendency to question narratives and to to think more critically you know unfortunately those are the people that are going to suffer because like you said they're the ones that are going to read the economists who are going to trust the experts who are going to rely on the outsourcing of their thinking to somebody else those are the people that are going to suffer the most. And Bitcoin ex exposes that, right? Bitcoin is, is you know, I think someone had referred to this, uh, you know, as an IQ test, right? It is your ability to distill and understand what Bitcoin is, is directly going to be related to, you know, your, your future lineage's wealth in a way. You know, and NVK calls it a one-time Kantian effect, right? Where if, you know, right now, right now is the chance to get in right beyond this once you know once the world catches on there is no more cancion and so um it is it is a way to it, it's go it's going to be a, a very harsh judge and, and like you always say and i think this is you know when i when i get to a when i get to a, a roadblock with uh you know trying to orange pill someone what i usually say is the you know your your famous line of there is no better teacher of opportunity cost than Bitcoin. And it's true. And it's it's sad in a way because people just grew up accustomed to trusting the experts and, and those who grow up that way and think of Bitcoin that way are going to suffer for it. Uh, it's it's sad and unfortunate, but uh, you know, the signal's there and you know, truth truth is self evident. Truth is is available for those who seek it and those who do seek it will will find Bitcoin and will be the better for it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh... 
it's 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 an amazing way to uh, get out of this giant world of fiat lies, which I discuss extensively in the fiat standard because it's it's been a century of right is not right. It's been a century of money printer makes right. It's not even might makes right. It's money printer makes right. Economic reality, scientific reality, is imposed by whoever manages to have access to the money printer, and. Um, this has been extremely devastating for humanity, as I argue in the fiat standard. You know, we're destroying our energy infrastructure because we've been overtaken by insane cults. Um, because, you know, the money printer has been hijacked by insane cults that say that uh, all the modern technology that makes our life possible is actually bad for you because it's uh, changing and ruining and destroying the weather. Um, that same thing with food. And of course, it's no coincidence that these crazy ideas become popular. These crazy ideas become popular because um, they this is how you can cover up inflation. It's very difficult for people to make ends meet as uh, inflation destroys their money. So then uh, government wants to cover that up. And uh, you know, you mentioned Egypt. I, I, I thought about including this in the fiat standard, but I thought it was a reference that was a little too long. Are you familiar with the Egyptian musician, Sheikh Imam? Have you ever heard uh, have, have heard of him? I'm not uh, not uh, familiar with the topic, but with a popular well, he, popular guy for sure. He had a, he had a song, I think, in the 70s or 80s, which is available on YouTube with subtitles with English translations, and it's it's really unique. And it's really uh, I keep saying I want to tweet this at some point, and I keep forgetting, but I'll I'll get to it now. And it's uh, the song is called "The Fool Will Lahma," which means uh, fava beans and meat. Uh, basically soy and meat in uh, in the modern parlance. And the whole song is about how all the experts agree that meat is bad for you and that uh, fava beans are good for you. And, uh, and isn't it curious that all of these people that are um, very well off want to convince us that we're better off eating fava beans? And this is, of course, a, a long running, decades long joke in Egypt that uh, meat got very expensive. And the government has been trying to convince everybody that, you know, eat our local beans. The beans are great. The beans are good for you. And of course, the beans are not good for you. <laughs> they're, they're terrible. But there's, there's no escaping this world of lies because they continue to print money. They continue to take away your ability to buy meat. And they continue to do, have enough money to finance uh, doctors and authorities to go on TV and tell you meat is bad for you. And cheap industrial crops are what's good for you. There's 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 no way out of this except Bitcoin because it just unplugs the monster from its root, takes away their ability to take away your money. It gives you the ability to go back into buying meat and living like a human being. And it makes the experts, Dr. Mohsen, uh, in that song, it makes Dr. Mohsen obsolete. I'll, I'll post the link to the song in the show notes. Uh, when we're done, it's a, it's it's a really great teaching uh, moment. I could I should have included it in the fiat standard, but I thought it was a little too long to explain it and translate it and place the context and all of that. But it's 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 a great great metaphor for the fiat system. I I can't wait to see it and, and hear it. It's I mean it's amazing that that was you, you said it was uh, in the seventies that this was uh, published. I'm not sure. I would imagine seventies okay. or eighties. Okay. Yeah, I mean, gr growing up, I mean, maybe this is kind of a quick aside. Growing up, you know, I was again, I was eleven years old when when I, you know, when we came to the U.S. and so I, I have memories of what we ate, and we ate meat, and and I didn't think anything of it because you know you're a kid and you you know you eat what's there. We ate meat maybe once every two weeks, and this is any kind of meat, you know, not not necessarily beef. It was you know mostly chicken, to be honest, um, but. Uh, yeah, you know the everyday meal there was, like you said, food, uh, fava beans, and uh, it, it, there's an interesting, I think, uh, study to be done there. In that, and I, I was just uh, telling the guys I, I was in Egypt over the summer for the first time, and since 1999, you know, pe people there who live there don't eat meat at all anymore. They can't afford it simply. Um, and Egypt is a, an interesting case study because per capita. Um, the highest rate of diabetes in the world is in Egypt, which is a really interesting thing for people who can't 
couldn't have eaten meat because they can't afford it and that, you know couldn't afford it then definitely can't afford it now um and, and so they're you know why is fiat science silent about this like diabetes is a big problem in the world right it's a it's an epidemic one one would call it and yet the biggest country in the world per capita that has diabetes there's there are no studies that are showing well how how is it that you know this country that is essentially vegan for the most part has such a high rate why is nobody studying this you know it's like the bots on twitter why is nobody talking about this so <laughs> it's there's a, there's a case study there for sure on fiat food absolutely absolutely and it's uh, it's very obvious why uh, the reason is that it's inflation i mean and and right now egypt again is going through more currency devaluation the egyptian pound continues to get abused more and more and more and people's purchasing power continues to get destroyed and of course, in Egypt, it was also combined with extremely extensive central planning and land reform, which sounds very uh, glorious. You know, for our grandparents' generation, this was amazing. You know, they're, they're taking the money from, they're taking the land from the rich people and giving it to the poor people. But really, what it means is you're taking land from people who know how to run it and who know how to operate it, and giving it to bureaucrats who are going to decide what to do with it. And the bureaucrats are not. Uh, are not optimizing for your health. The bureaucrats are optimizing for ticking boxes and um, producing output and, you know, how much calories and proteins we can get rather than just in thinking about the quality. And so, of course, it's far more optimal for them to grow these industrial crops. And it's just been uh, absolutely devastating. It's, it's uh, all, all Egyptian comedy and movies are constantly discussing this. Which uh, brings us nicely to the topic of inflation and CPI. So, um, so you've done extremely deep dives into the CPI. What have you found out? <laughs> yeah. So let, let me first talk about the inspiration behind this. I think uh, yeah. you know I I started to try to orange bill people in the run up of, of price late 2020 when it was becoming when when you know the topic of inflation and the topic of money printing. Um, started to become obvious and become a, a mainstream narrative and what i started to find from trying to you know bring this topic up to to people that are you know cl close to me friends and family is that it's really hard to um as many uh people who try to orange pill people will find it's very hard to get someone to think about bitcoin like you bring up the topic of bitcoin and it becomes like a taboo subject like oh it's dead oh it's for criminals you know the mainstream fud the normal person doesn't have the capacity to to listen to you, you know, des describe the details of, of why Bitcoin works, and, and definitely don't have the time to read, you know, the Bitcoin standard at a, at a get go. But that was kind of the inspiration. It's like, how do you reach people where they are? Um, and so, I, I think actually that's that's probably one of the main reasons you pivoted from finishing. Uh, the fundamental of economics, uh, principles of economics textbook, which you, I think you were working on before the fiat standard, and then you pivoted to finishing the fiat, fiat standard first. But I mean, I, the idea is the best way to bring Bitcoin to the masses is not even to talk about Bitcoin. It's just to help them understand, you know, how screwed up the current system is and how, um, you know, why the things that they see in life, you know, everybody feels inflation now, um, why that is and how that works. And so you don't even need to mention Bitcoin. Actually, majority of, you know, of, of our, our threads, we don't mention Bitcoin until like the second or, or the second to last tweet, because we're just describing what's wrong with the world today and how this, you know, insane system that we're in works. And that in itself is the pitch, right? Here's, here's this crazy system with you know 12 people really one person deciding the fate for you know billions if not trillions of dollars in the world how that works and then you have bitcoin where nobody gets to decide that works you choose right and so that's that's the inspiration behind um behind a lot of the threads and so you know i i've covered a lot of topics i covered from you know how how the federal reserve system works um banking runs cpi and i think the topic of cpi is is <laughs> really the most interesting one because um you know it, it's all hidden in plain sight right anybody can spend some time reading about what you know how the system works and what cpi is and how it's defined and how it's calculated and how it has changed over time and anybody with half a brain right can can see that it's a complete complete scam and and that's that's the inspiration is how do how do we get people to realize this and, that, and that's uh, kind of what i dive into 
So we, we can cover any one of them. Uh, I don't know if you have a particular order in mind, but um, you know, we, we could start with any, any one of them and we can start to go through it. If, uh, if you have a preference, let me know. Um, how about with the one about uh, how the CPI is calculated? How the calculation has changed over the year? Do you think we should start with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I've, I've written a number of threads about that. Let me, uh, it's, I think, why is CPI a hoax is, is uh, the title for that one. And the, the idea, I mean, I mean, you really speak to this well, I think, in, in the fiat standard. And, you know, when I, <laughs> a quick aside, I, I usually try to listen to books first and if, if just because of time and I'm um, usually able to like attend when I'm reading, when I'm listening to a book. And, uh, and with the fiat standard, I, I need it to like, I listened to it and I was like, this is going way too fast. I need to slow down. I need a notebook and I need to take notes and I need a highlighter. And it was, it was a, you know, it was a study. Uh, it was almost, uh, almost like a textbook. And so, um, I, it, you describe it so well in the fiat standard. And that was, you know, one of the main inspirations for some of these threats. And, you know, C, CPI, as you describe in a fiat standard is a, is a, <laughs> is a measurement without a unit. And it's, it, you, you and anyone who studied any level of mathematics, right, or uh, or science or engineering knows you don't you you're not measuring anything if you don't have a unit, and it's a self-referential loop. And the way that you know CPI is calculated, it, it the attempt. Let's let's go. I, I try to steel man a lot of these cases, right, to to, to really show what the intention is, and um, you know. There are smart people, some smart people, I should say, behind behind some of this. And so trying to see things from their lens and trying to show what they're trying to do and then showcasing why that's completely irrational. But the idea here is you're looking to try to quantify the increase in all consumer goods. And initially, most people don't notice. Initially, when CPI was put together, it wasn't even for government purposes. It was to help um, industry. It was to help companies who are trying to see what where consumers are spending their money that was the initial initial intent and this is by the way this is all from the bls like anything i find on cpi comes from the bureau of labor statistics in the u.s which has these explanations and has this history hidden in plain sight anybody can go and find it so the idea is you come up with a basket of goods to reflect overall price increases for everybody and figure out where people are spending your money okay great the questions are anybody with critical thinking abilities would say, well, hold on a second. How can you, for millions of people, if not billions of people, try to come up with a basket of goods that represents everybody's aggregate demand? And Keynesians, as you know, and as you write about, like to talk in aggregates. And it, it's a nonsensical, it's a, it's a futile attempt to begin with. But let's, let's you know, play, play it out and, and pretend that it's not futile. So you come up with this theoretical basket of goods that's ever-changing because consumer habits change. And you try to constantly try to reflect the rise of prices and everything. Because number only go up on a fiat on a fiat standard, you know, it, which is another issue. But you try to quantify that, and so okay, we have this basket of goods. It's ever changing. We're doing our best to try to quantify it. Okay, let's pretend that that's completely normal behavior and rational and actually, uh, you know, and and able, uh, something you're able to do. And how how would anybody in with any amount of data in the world be able to? keep up with everybody's personal basket, right? So if I'm all of a sudden, I've got two young kids, when they enter college, all of a sudden my basket of goods, the things that I'm trying to pay for, the things that I want and desire, all of a sudden they're completely different than everybody else. I'm no longer the average. How many people are at the actual average? So it's a nonsensical approach to a, non, like a, a non-solvable problem, which by the way, like hides the actual root cause of the issue. The only reason we care about this is because the, the the money base is going up and it completely dismisses that it's it's like the money base will do what it needs to do we just care about how how expensive things are getting so it's it's a nonsensical problem with a nonsensical approach to solving it with and even if if it was a problem that's solvable or a problem that you can quantify the tool that you're trying to use to calculate it is just it's it's without a unit so what do you what are you actually measuring um but you know that's that's kind of the gist of that um curious if you have thoughts or uh, any one particular piece of information that you thought was uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is ultimately what it comes down to that. Um, and Mises identified this uh, many decades ago. I don't know exactly what year he was saying is that it's, it's a tragedy that the definition of inflation has moved from um, the increase in the money supply to the rise in prices. And this is, uh, this is obviously, obviously uh, a, a bait and switch operation because you know the term inflate refers to something that's volumetric so the volume of money inflates you know you inflate a tire you inflate the volume something that has to be three-dimensional with volume and that's what the money supply is there's a, a quantity of money that is being inflated and that's that, that's where the term comes from and in the 19th century this was you know 19th century before language was broken by fiat this was what inflation referred to now they've then you know it's a double whammy on the one hand they're trying to convince you that the increase in the money supply is not related to the rise in prices you know prices rise because of all kinds of different reasons some of them might have to do with the money supply but the money supply needs to increase because if the money supply doesn't increase then we have a reduction in aggregate demand and then we get recessions and unemployment and so if you don't want the money supply to increase then obviously you hate poor people and you hate children. So we need to have the money supply increase. We just need to make sure that it doesn't increase too much. But inflation is a rise in prices. So, so now that we've, with that switch, we've moved it around to this you know, act of God where sometimes prices begin to rise because of you know, various reasons. There's always something. So right now it's uh, um, the pandemic and the war in Ukraine previously it was there's always something you know the the the, the arab israeli war of the 1970s um somehow it led to like a decade of uh, price rises that started before the war and continued decades after the war um but in in the macro textbook they try and convince you that that was really the key driver of it but when you do this when you um when when you switch the definition from the rise in the money supply to the rise in prices then you've um mo you know you've hit the smoking gun effectively because usually it, the smoking gun is look the money supply is going up and the prices of things that you value are going up look at the price of your home look at your college education look at the, uh, the cost of the food that you would like to eat you know not the cheap industrial waste that they're telling you you should eat look at the actual food that you know your grandparents craved and wanted and worked and slaved for all day um, and look at the price of that food how it's going up and you see that yeah it is going up at a rate quite similar to the increase of the money supply obviously not precisely because nothing is precise in prices and in economics it's not uh it's it's, it's not um it's not a mechanical relationship where we can find this relationship, but it is in broad terms, uh, for, you know, the increase in the money supply is a far better reflection of increases in prices than the CPI, which is just completely broken. So you hide the smoking gun of the link between the money supply and the prices. And then once you've hidden the smoking gun, then it's about just finding a bunch of bureaucrats to get together and whip up a number for CPI. And then of course, uh, the mathematical invalidity of it is where, um, you know, this is why it makes no sense to define inflation as price rises because you can't measure price rises. And the key point, as I mentioned in the, in the fiat standard, I think this is this is really the key point that I've never heard a Keynesian try and respond to. This is one of the many, many, many things where all of these uh, NPC uh, fiat economists and PhDs have absolutely no ability of even acknowledging that you made this point. Like I've never heard anybody not just respond to it, like acknowledge that this is a point. It's just, you could, you know, that you, you could open their eyes and make them stare at this uh, on a page and they will refuse to read it. And the point is, you can't measure anything without a unit. The, this is one of the many idiotic things about modern macroeconomics. Um, you know, they talk about utility and they measure utility with something called utils in the macro textbook and in the micro textbook. So I remember giving my students exams where they needed to solve for the number of utils that you get from things. What is a util? Uh, and how can you value different things in terms of utils? And the, it's, it's ridiculous. There is no such a thing as a util. There is no unit. And similarly with CPI, there is no unit. What you're measuring 
is a circular reference. It's basically an invalid mathematical operation without a unit because without a unit, you're measuring the increase in prices in terms of the prices themselves. And the increase, the prices themselves are of course are rising because the value of the currency is declining. So the whole thing is a circular reference. The currency's value is dropping. And because the currency's value is dropping, the prices are rising. But, and this is where, you know, this is where the pseudoscience becomes apparent. And this is the point that none of them will ever respond to. The composition of the basket of goods itself changes as a result of the change in the prices, as a result in the rise on the, of the prices. So when the money supply goes up, because the government printed a ton of money to hand over to their cronies so that they can kill foreigners and uh, bail out bankers and buy elections, the standard operating procedure of governments worldwide. When they print a bunch of money, you know the, 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 the bankers who get rich and the cronies who get rich and the you know the cronies who help them buy the elections and the weapons manufacturers they have more money they go and buy more of the things that are out there for everybody to buy and so the prices of goods begin to rise so as somebody who did not receive some of that printed money some of that freshly increased money obviously i'm simplifying here but you know because the money spreads out to everybody eventually but here this is where the Cantillon effect is important some people get the money first. So the people who get the money first, they get the money before the prices have risen. And so they go and they spend that money at the old low prices and they benefit from it. And then the prices rise. So then the people who receive that money later, you know, the guy you buy from, when they take that money and they can, um, when they take that money and they go and spend it, they witness that the prices are rising. So what do you do, you know, when, when the early Cantillon beneficiaries they are the ones who went and bought the beef at the low price. Now the price of the beef has gone up. So what do you do? How can you buy the beef now? And the answer is you can't buy the beef anymore. You can't afford it. So what do you do? You get beans, you get soy, you get all of these uh, very unhealthy, cheap substitutes. And that's changed the composition of your basket of goods. So the uh, the example that i give in the bitcoin standard in the fiat standard is imagine the price of everything goes up 10x and so you used to spend all imagine you only buy beef you used to buy a steak every day and you'd earn ten dollars a day you buy a steak every day it'll simplify everything assume this is an economy where only thing you buy is beef the price of beef is ten dollars you earn ten dollars you buy the beef that's your basket of goods well then what happens if um, somebody captures the central bank's money printer and they print a ton of money and they hand it out to 5% of the population or 10% of the population and then they go around and they keep buying uh, all of the beef and then because they have a lot of money they bid up the price of the beef and the price of the beef goes up to $100. Well you only earn $10 you can't just go and buy $100 worth of beef so you're gonna have to make do with a cheap substitute. What has happened to your basket of goods? It's still $10. You earn $10. You have to spend $10. You have no alternative. Maybe you can dip into your savings and spend a little bit extra. Uh, but without question, the composition of the basket of goods is going to decline. And so this is why it is such a ridiculous scam, because you have to spend what you have. And so therefore, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to adjust the contents of the basket to reflect the inflation. And so using the CPI as a measure of inflation is completely ridiculous because it's reflecting the choices that you've taken as a result of the inflation. It's not measuring the inflation. It's a tautology that is rigged to come up with an extremely understated and extremely lagging measure of inflation because the composition of the basket of goods is adjusted. And this is what the BLS and all of these government agencies that correct those statistics, this is what they're there for. They claim to be tracking the basket of goods, but of course the basket of goods is being um, determined by the spending. Yeah, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. And what, what's interesting, right, is they try to 
um, explain away all of this. I don't, I don't know if you uh, have, have seen this. So they, the BLS website has a common misconceptions about CPI page where they try to address this exact point that you're making that because you have an ever-changing basket of goods, the basket is constantly changing. And so you're not really measuring the basket. You're measuring people's preference for cheaper goods because they can no longer afford the goods that were in the basket to begin with. So they, they try to, it, it's, it's laughable. They try to explain this. So specifically on um, owner's equivalent rent. So for those who uh, may, may not, and this was a topic of another thread, but we can touch on it here because it's related. So up until 1983, um, the, you know, the, the calculation of CPI for housing just included, at least in the U.S., housing prices. So until 1983, housing prices were what composed the shelter cost in the CPI calculation. So 1983 comes up, and of course, we all know that the 70s and, and you know 1971, we come off the, the gold standard for good, whatever was left of the gold standard anyway. And, uh, and so things naturally start to go up because we're in full fiat world. And naturally, the things that accrue in value are the things that you can't you know, produce as fast as you can produce monetary units, housing being one of them. And so in 1983, they introduced this concept of owner's equivalent rent. And now the reason they, again, steel manning here, the reason they, they say to do that, they say that they did that. And there's a, there's a six page, uh, uh, PDF for those who are interested. I can, I can share with you guys to put in the show notes. But the reason they say that they did this is because they are trying to separate the investment portion of housing from the utility portion of housing and at least that's the idea and and so they say okay well people use housing both as an investment and as a utility and so we're trying to separate that now what they don't address is why that's the case in the first place it's like hold on a second houses are not investments houses should never have been investments houses never historically had been investments they are utilities right you use a house for what you want to use it for it's a consumer and good Exactly. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. So you're you're consuming it because it gives you utility, but then people started to use it as investments. Why is that the case? But instead of answering the question, why is that the case? They tried to just explain it away. And so, you know, the the actual response to that point um, on on this misconceptions about CPI page on a BLS, and I'll read it because it's it's it I it's pure clown world. So uh, the question is. The CPI used to include the value of a house in calculating inflation, and now you know you're using an estimate of what each house would rent for. Doesn't this switch simply lower the official inflation rate? That's the question, and the official answer is no. Until 1983, the CPI measure of homeowner cost was based largely on house prices. The long recognized flaw of that approach that was long recognized, but they only addressed it somehow after 1971. Anyway, the long recognized flaw of that approach was that owner-occupied housing combined both consumption and investment elements, and the CPI is designed to exclude investment items. The approach now used in CPI called rental equivalents measures the value of shelter to owner-occupants as the amount they forego by not renting out their homes. Then they start to mansplain it away. The rental equivalents approach is grounded in fiat planes. Yes, yes, fiat planes. Yes, there's nothing wrong with mansplaining. Uh, <laughs> the rental equivalents approach is grounded in economic theory. That is received broad support from academic economists who, by the way, are fiat economists, and each of the prominent panels and agencies that have viewed the CPI and is the most commonly used methods in countries and in the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And so they go into this whole, like, trust us, we're the experts explanation. And that is exactly the point, is you're not meant it, to... It it's worse than just trust us we're the expert they get to the dead end of trust us we're the expert so they resort to trust those guys they're the expert but you know, <laughs> ignore the fact that we pay them and ignore the fact yes. that all the other oecd countries are just copying the us because that's what everybody does <sighs> yeah absolutely and so there is no actual logical explanation and it doesn't address the root cause of the problem to begin with is why are houses being used in investments they never talk about that and yeah. the real reason is because you can't print houses as fast as you can print money. 
that's the real reason, and they don't address it. And so anybody with any critical thinking will look at this and say, you know, like if you're not an NPC, right, if you're sitting there nodding your head, of course, yeah, this makes perfect sense. I trust you guys. You know what you're talking about. You have economic theory, and, you know, you've got your PhDs, and you've got your calculations, and your geometric mean formulas, which is another laughable subject. They, you know, they completely destroy the entire science and value of statistics, which, by the way, is another rabbit hole. Like, why isn't statistics as a mathematical concept taught in every single high school curriculum in the U.S.? It is not by accident that nobody is, you know, you only learn statistics if you need to for your college degree, which is, you know, maybe roughly half of college degrees in the U.S., not a pure math that you would study instead of, say, calculus, which I would argue is the lesser important math, maybe more for engineers is important. Anyway, so they completely destroy the concept of statistics. And so people don't have any statistical um, knowledge to be able to say, no, this is BS. Like, you know, we don't trust you. Show, you know, show us why this is the case. And so, you know, it, it's, it, it's so rich. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, the, the housing example is, I mean, it is a related point, but it is, uh, it's another egregious uh, manipulation of reality, which is just ridiculous. Um, a house is a consumer good. It's something that you consume and a house requires running costs. So the cost of maintaining a house is usually between three to 5% per year between uh, property taxes and just maintenance and um, trying to keep the house running. You know, you need to paint it every now and then, you need to fix the pipes when they break. That stuff adds up. And it's usually around three to 5% per year, if you're lucky. Um, you know, if you don't get major, uh, you know, major problems, sometimes you get major problems, you need to relay the tiles or you need to change the entire, uh, uh, electric supply, electric system, or the uh, water supply, all of these things can be more expensive. So it could go up more than 5% in a year, but you're paying a maintenance cost every year. It is a consumer good. It's a durable consumer good, but it is a consumer good. You consume a house in the same way that um, a washing machine is a consumer good. It's a durable consumer good. You know, some people can keep their washing machine for 30 years. Um, your laptop can last you 10 years. Still, it's a consumer good. It's not a. Um, it's not an investment. It's not an investment. Is something that yields a return, and savings is money. Money is cash. Cash is a saving. It's something that you hold on to, with the intention of selling it on, but something that you don't have any use for. This is basic economics. This is basic accounting. Accountants understand this. Um, Pierre Rochard, you know, he, he he can very simply explain this to you and to anybody. And he gets it. And as an accountant, you know, uh, an investment is a cash flow. You have an investment, let's say you own a stock, you own a million dollar in the stock and every year it pays you a dividend. That's what an investment is. A house that you live in does not pay you a dividend. It doesn't pay you. It actually takes money from you. You have to pay on it. So it's a consumer good. You just need to keep continuing to maintain it. Money is an asset, but it yields no different. It, it yields no dividend. And it does not require maintenance. You don't need to keep paying for your money in order to maintain it. I mean, well, maybe you do, but you need to store the money. And so there is a kind of cost on the money, but that, that's besides the point. But that's the difference between money and saving, between money and investment and consumer goods. Those are the three ways in which you can allocate your money. You can either save your money, you can spend your money on a consumer good, or you can invest your money in a cash yielding uh, enterprise that generates cash flow for you. Uh, the astonishing thing that they do, and they teach you this in macroeconomics textbooks, is that they've redefined uh, housing as being a saving, as an investment and a saving uh, in, in a very weird way. And I, in, in my next book, in the Principles of Economics textbook, I've got this quote from Mankiw, which is considered maybe the most popular the most commonly used uh, macro textbook. It's completely, completely idiotic garbage. It's astonishing. Um, and in this book, they try and explain the difference between saving and economics, uh, saving and investment. And uh, I'm going to just read the whole thing. Uh, the terms saving and investment, this is me quoting uh, Mankiw. The terms saving and investment can sometimes be confusing. Most people use these terms casually and sometimes interchangeably. By contrast, the macroeconomists who put together the national income accounts use these terms carefully and distinctly. 
Consider an example. Of course, the amazing thing is he doesn't even explain to you how they use it. He just starts with the example because he's going to pull the wool over your eyes. Suppose that Larry earns more than he spends and deposits his unspent income in a bank or uses it to buy some stock or a bond from a corporation. So depositing in a bank or buy stock or bond. These are three examples. One of them is saving, two are investment. This is what normal people would think. But let's see what the macroeconomists think. Because Larry's income exceeds his consumption, he adds to the nation's savings. So it's saving regardless of where he puts it, whether it's in the bond or the stock or the income, it's all saving. Because in the Keynesian model, anything that you don't consume is considered saving. Larry might think of himself as investing his money, <laughs> but a macroeconomist would call Larry's act saving rather than investment. So even when you buy stocks, you're not really saving, you're not really investing, you're saving. In the language of macroeconomics, Investment refers to the purchase of new capital, such as equipment or buildings. When Mo borrows from the bank to build himself a new house, he adds to the nation's investments. So when you lent, when you put your money in the bank, that's not saving, uh, that's not an investment. But when somebody took out the loan to buy a house, to build a house, which is a consumer good, that's an investment which again makes no sense. And so now we're in two levels of absurdity. It's not an investment because it's a consumer good. The guy's buying a consumer good. It's not a cash yielding asset. And then between parentheses, Mankiw continues, remember the purchase of a new house is the one form of household spending that is investment rather than consumption. So again, the scam goes on where, you know, he shifts from trying to explain to you what's the difference between saving and investment to then moving on to why saving. Uh, why housing is uh, investment rather than consumption. Closes the parentheses and goes on. Similarly, when the Curly Corporation sells some stock and uses the proceeds to build a new factory, it also adds to the nation's investments. So you buying the stock is not investment. The company selling the stock, taking the money to buy itself a new factory is the investment. That's how they make the Keynesian accounting work. Although, and um, now Q continues, although the accounting identity S equals I, this is a big thing in macroeconomics. So in macroeconomics, the way that they make this idiotic Keynesian system works, work is that um, there's spending, there's saving and there's investment. And the economy is in equilibrium when the total amount of saving is equal to the amount of investment. In other words, when uh, all of the money that Larry is putting into the bank and all the Larrys are putting into the bank and stocks and bonds are equal to the amount of money that Mo and the Curly Corporation are spending on new factories and new houses, then we have equilibrium. But if those amounts are not equal, then we're out of equilibrium. And either we have too much saving, in which case we don't have enough investment, in which case we have a recession because we're not investing enough and we're not spending enough, or we have too little saving, in which case we have too much investment, too much spending going on, and therefore uh, we have inflation. And the equivalent is, you know, the S equals I, that you get that when there's a, uh, that's when we have a equilibrium. And also equilibrium happens when aggregate expenditure equals to GDP, aggregate expenditure equals to production. So when the amount of money that we're spending is equal to the value of the production that we're producing, then the economy is at equilibrium. But if the amount of money that we're spending is larger than the value of the production, this is completely idiotic, because the value of the production is the amount of money that we're spending and the value is, you know, value in economics is subjective, but how are you going to measure the value of production distinctly from the value of the money that we're spending? But in their mind, if the value of the production that you're uh, engaging in is larger than the amount of um, uh, spending, then what we have is a recession where we don't have enough expenditure. And then uh, the reverse is if the amount of spending that we're engaging in is larger than the amount of production than what we have is inflation. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> that's why we get inflations and recessions because too much aggregate expenditure or too little aggregate expenditure or too much saving or too little saving. And the answer is if we have inflation, then we need to reduce the amount of investment and we need to reduce the amount of save, uh, uh, spending. And if we have a recession, 
then we need to reduce the amount of saving and we need to increase the amount of investment and consumption. It's just such a ridiculous, um, fictitious way of looking at how the world works. So let's just continue. Although the accounting identity S equals I shows that saving and investment are equal for the economy as a whole, this does not have to be true for every individual household or firm. Larry's saving can be greater than his investment and he can deposit the excess in a bank. Mo's saving can be less than his investment and he can borrow the shortfall from a bank. Banks and other financial institutions make these individual differences between saving and investment possible by allowing one person's saving to finance another person's investment. It's astonishing how they um, just paper over all of this stuff in order to arrive at the predetermined conclusion which they want to arrive at, which is that the answer to all of your problems comes from more inflation. And this is what it really comes down to. If anybody's unemployed, if there's any problem, don't ask about what the cause is, which you will only understand if you understand the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Let's only think about how we can fix it. And how we can fix it is through more inflation always yeah i mean say the this last 10 minutes or so was the best pitch for why everybody should uh should pre-order uh principles of economics which which you're working on and i can't wait for the release um it's it, it it's laughable it's it's so sad and i think we, we touched on this in the beginning i think the amazing part is anybody from the year 1900 who has no college education can read that nonsense and say this makes no sense this you know reality slaps you in the face and your theories fall apart right you all your models are broken in, in the infamous uh, giga chat sailor words and what, what's also incredible is that there is a target inflation rate right like what where does two percent come from like nobody has a valid that i've seen at least maybe maybe you've seen some fiat econom economist explain this where does two percent come from i mean two percent historically is the inflation rate of the gold supply? And ultimately, that's where you know that's that's where this two percent target comes from. But it, it's it's nonsensical. It's embarrassing. And the the point we touched on before is it's a it's a system of unending complexity. You try to even if you have the time, which nobody does, if you have the time to try to peel back the onions and say, okay, let, let's pretend this is real. Let's pretend this is true. Let me ask from first principles why this should be the case, which, you know, the first question is why should there be any inflation at all in a society that is getting better at producing things, that is more effective in, and, and, and able to produce things faster, cheaper, better. Like, there should be no inflation. There should be deflation. Nobody talks about that in, in fiat world. But let's just pretend that that's not the case and you start to peel back the onions. Why the, why, you ask why. And as soon as you start to you know, unpeel this onion, if anybody had the time to, which nobody does, you, you get to the conclusion in that, it's just that it's a system that is self-referential, that is self-reinforcing, that comes down to trust us. We're the experts. Here's some math equations. You know, and, and enjoy your you know yeah. your fiat degree. So it's it's and, a and sad it, thing. It it comes down to the fact that if you disagree, you just don't get funded. And so the entire generation of kids that are learning uh, garbage economics in university today have to learn garbage mainstream economics. They have to try and convince themselves that this nonsense makes sense, that uh, this idea that aggregate expenditure can be higher than output, and that's what causes inflation. Like this just numerological sophistry is the cause of actual things that happen in the real world. It's not that human beings are doing things. It's not that actual human beings have gone and printed money. No, it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> aggregate expenditure goes up because of animal spirits. I mean, they say it. They shamelessly actually put it out there and say animal spirits are the reason for all of this shit happening. It's it's laughable. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, and, and Thomas, I think, had, uh, had mentioned this in the chat. Um, the idea of risk-free rates, right? And we we had a thread about this back in April. Um, you know, back back when uh, when. When the treasury market was not yielding what it's yielding now but you know the, the idea that anything is risk-free right the, the the entire financial infrastructure so maybe maybe this is a another you know deep dive at some point but the, the, the entire financial structure trillions of dollars is based on the risk-free rate which is the return of u.s treasuries how much are u.s treasury is yielding and and so thousands if not hundreds of thousands of financial planners and traders and money managers are trying to beat what the risk-free rate in fiat terms 
gives people. But the idea of risk-free, right, the idea of a baseline rate of return for an investor is also nonsensical, right? Like there is no guarantee. And it reminds me of the book, for, like there is no guarantee that the U.S. won't default. It's probably the least likely country to default, um, nominally anyway. Um, but, it, you know, it, there, there is this famous quote from uh, from the book that dives into the Weimar uh, Republic and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, on the death of money. I forget the exact title of the book. When Money Dies. That's it. When Money Dies, um, yeah. Yeah, where, you know, this lady, and this is a real story, this lady goes to a bank and she's trying to get, uh, she had some kind of government bond and she's trying to get her cash back. Um, at, they used to do it at banks back then. And the bank teller basically tells her, my lady, where is, you know, where is this government you speak of? Like, this is a government guaranteed bond that she's trying to trade in for actual cash. And, and he says, the government that gave you this promise no longer exists. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not there now. We may not, you not get there for decades. Who knows? But the idea of a risk-free rate as the baseline for all economic investment and calculation is just this system of, of, you know, a house of cards that as soon as you take out one card, the whole thing falls apart. And again, for people to have the time, it's self, self-fulfilling, right? For people to get out of their, you know, their worldview and look at how the system is constructed takes time. Nobody in the current fiat system has the time to step back, see how the entire, you know, the entire construction of the system works. To be able to say, no, this is utter nonsense, I'm going to opt out, I'm going to go to, to Bitcoin. And the reason they can't have the time to do that is because we've completely outsourced thinking, we've completely outsourced critical assessment of how things work. And and it's by design because you have to constantly be on this hamster wheel to just provide for tomorrow. It's the idea of time preference. Because you don't know your time, you know, you're, you're just trying to make ends meet, you're trying to make your monthly bills, you're trying to feed your family the next day. And and because you you don't have time to step back and look at these things holistically, it's no it's no wonder why, you know, you have to trust the experts because you have no other time to do your own research and understand how things work from first principles. Yeah, you mentioned the two percent. Um, I dug up an article from uh, Mises.org, which I posted in the comments, uh, and we'll post it in the show notes, which uh, explains the origin. And uh, basically, the answer is two percent comes from from thin air. <laughs> Literally, this uh, it was a guy called Brash, uh, Don Brash, I think. Yeah, Don Brash, who was the managing director of the New Zealand Kiwi Fruit Authority, and uh, then he. <laughs> was given the job of head of the Central Bank of New Zealand. And they just said, you know what? He admitted, he said the figure was plucked out of the air to influence the public's expectations. The idea was if you keep telling people that we're going to get to 2% inflation, you're going to make them expect 2% inflation and then 2% inflation is going to materialize. And then it created a kind of magic of its own. Merely by announcing its goals for inflation, New Zealand made that result a reality. And this, of course, is related to another um, silly part of modern uh, macroeconomic voodoo, which is a theory called uh, rational expectations. And this guy called uh, Robert Lucas, who came up with it in the 1970s, and he won the Bank of Sweden uh, prize for uh, pretending that economics is a science, uh, which is handed out by the Bank of Sweden under the name of Alfred Nobel, even though he had absolutely nothing to do with it. And he won it for this remarkable invention. And the idea is that, and, and this, I mean, I mean, you can mock it because it is completely idiotic, obviously, but uh, you can kind of sympathize with it because in a sense, this kind of nonsense in the 1970s did help rein in the insane Keynesians who were just uh, up until the 70s, you know, they were convinced that you can fix everything by printing money. And uh, the rational expectations idea is that um, it doesn't dispute the insane Keynesian nonsense. Uh, so the most charitable interpretation is that this is a grown up who understands economics, and then he tried to come up with a way to stop the Keynesians from destroying the world uh, by lying to them on their own terms. But I think the more you read into it, you think that, no, he truly believes this. Um, but the idea is that if you have, so 
th it doesn't dispute the Keynesian premise that the central bank can cause economic recovery by increasing the money supply, by raising aggregate demand, by lowering interest rates. That if you have a recession, if you have unemployment, you can fix that by just um, having the central bank lower interest rates and allow more spending. You know, the way to fix unemployment is with inflation, and the way to fix inflation is with unemployment, as we see the central bank doing right now. This is uh, the basic uh, fundamental building block of Keynesian nonsense. And uh, Lucas presented uh, um, a critique of this, wherein he said, oh, well, actually, people are not very stupid, and so they can expect inflation. And so because they expect inflation to happen, then that is going to annul the impact of it. So the point is, if the central bank uh, prints money and hands it out, yes, it does lead to aggregate expenditure increasing. But if people become wise to this trick, then they're just going to adjust their prices and adjust their behavior to essentially um, negate the impact of this inflationary monetary policy. And so it will no longer work. So obviously it's completely ridiculous. It's not because of uh, inflation that it doesn't work. Uh, sorry, it's not because of expectations that it doesn't work. It doesn't work because it doesn't work because you can't make economic production happen by printing more money because we are not in an insane world where uh, printing more tickets for a stadium magically generates more uh, seats for that stadium. Uh, we don't live in a bizarro Keynesian world of insane uh, lunatics where uh, physical reality doesn't matter. Uh, printing money doesn't work because it only does inflation. Um, so you can kind of see the uh, sympathize with it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, however, this didn't end up just killing Keynesian economics because it wasn't a powerful enough critique. It's resulted in central banks doing what they do right now, which is they need to try and get the element of surprise from the market. This is what this is how you can understand current um, monetary policy in that as long as the people continue to think that the central bank is going to, to uh, loosen monetary policy, they need to keep tightening. Like the beatings will continue until you believe that the beatings will continue. Once you believe that the beatings will continue, then you know you'll stop spending money. You'll stop speculating on the stock market. You'll take your money out of the stock market. The stock market will crash. Your spending will decline. Unemployment will go up, and then they will get what they want. So once you they once you believe that the Fed is no longer going to ease. Once you believe that tightening is going to stop, that's when they can pivot. That's when they can change it. And this is this is what the rational expectations revolution, as they called it, has accomplished. And so it's resulted in in like the best um, the best kind of uh, way to understand the impact of it is that it gave us Alan Greenspan, who one day in a press conference he said. Um, he said something along the lines, I forget the exact quote, but it was something along the lines of, look, if you, if what I'm saying is clear to you, then you're clearly misunderstanding me. You're not supposed to be understanding what I'm saying. I'm supposed to be confusing you. I'm supposed to be making random noises. And you're supposed to be confused about what I'm going to be doing. And this is why, you know, central bankers are always desperate to try and uh, second guess, to, to, to try and say, uh, you know, um, this is why central bankers are always desperate to try and surprise the market because you can't have them expect things because if you're if you're printing money or if you're easing while they expect you to ease then the easing is not going to work if you're tightening when they expect you to tighten the tightening is not going to really work you have to be surprising them and this is the insanity of it so this then gave us the two percent thing which is um a kind of a derivative of that in a sense that if you just keep telling them 2%, eventually they believe it and then it sticks some way or the other. It's, it's all so ridiculous. It's, if, if it makes any sense <laughs> to borrow a quote from, Fried, from uh, Greenspan, if any of this makes sense, then you clearly don't understand it. Which is what I always used to tell my undergraduates uh, when I was teaching them uh, this Keynesian stuff. I'd always teach this and then I'd ask, does this make sense? 
And in my macro and micro class, Thomas here was in my classes in Lebanon. He'll remember. There was always these engineering students who were taking the, the course. And so the majority of kids were business students, but there'd always be about 10, 15% of the class is uh, engineering students. And, you know, engineers are much better at uh, on thinking through things. And so I'd always explain this and it would be, you know, I'd put up the equations on the board. Aggregate expenditure goes up, inflation's, uh, and uh, aggregate expenditure goes down because it's a recession, uh, GDP versus uh, out output versus aggregate expenditure. And I'd always ask them, you know, does this make sense? And then the engineers would always say, no. And I'd tell them, yep, that's correct. You get it. If it makes sense, then clearly you don't get it. You clearly are not understanding what's going on. This shouldn't make sense. And it's it's like I, I'd sit them down. I'd always spend some time at the end of the class explaining to them why this doesn't make sense, why they need to believe it, and how they should answer the questions in the exam but what they should understand about why the world actually works this way in that this is essentially inflation propaganda. You have to understand these are people who are um, arriving at these ridiculous answers, not just because they're stupid. They have to arrive at these ridiculous answers and they have to be stupid because they need to arrive at the answer that is pro-inflation. That's why they're hired. So if you were intelligent and you found that this was ridiculous, then you're just not going to be able to make it in uh, modern academia. You're not going to be able to write the textbook that is going to be taught in these universities. You have to believe in this and you have to pretend to understand it. And yeah, Thomas is saying he also told us to throw the textbook in the trash at some point. Yeah, I mean, imagine having to keep one of these books around it. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's 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 so much there. I mean, on, on the point, and I think this pivots us well to our next topic I want to get into, on a point of Alan Greenspan and him kind of flip-flopping within the same interview, yesterday, Jerome Powell, so the FOM, FOMC decision came out yesterday for the month of November, and uh, it, it, it was purely that, just complete mixed signals, and he's saying two messages at once, and you figure it out, basically, is it's the message he's giving until... Until the beatings will continue until you know until things improve and he says we will stay the course until the job is done same press conference we don't need inflation to come down to slow down the pace of increases that is interest rate increases and so it's sending mixed messages it is complete smoke and mirrors you want the market to believe one thing and so you say one thing and you know me meantime in the meantime we haven't actually had like significant quantitative tightening yet they're just raising interest rates they've been talking about quantitative tightening for a number of months now and and you know they've barely made a blip on the fed balance sheet and so you know it's 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 complete smoke and mirrors it's completely it's mental manipulation it's what it is it's the current monetary policy is mental manipulation to get the market to move one way or the other um based on what you say and based on the signals that you send and based on what uh tie color you wear and based on there, there are people who make a living literally just looking at the body language of Jerome Powell and other FOMC members and and try to judge which way the market will move based based on what the words they use and and if they stutter or not. And those are people who have actual analyst jobs at big companies who are just literally fed watching. They try to judge which way the, the money spigot is going to flow. And it it's a complete system of, of chaos. And uh, it, it, it started with the Federal Reserve being created in 1913, and uh, you know, arguably, it just gotten worse over time. And I think one thing that I, I, I want to, you know, help us to maybe pivot to the to the topic of the Federal Reserve and the Financial Oversight Committee and all those institutions that try to make monetary decisions for billions of people worldwide that you know shouldn't exist is I think it was Preston Pish the other day that uh, kind of spoke about this where he I think he said something to the effect of and I'm paraphrasing because I don't I don't have the exact tweet open but essentially the entire fighting inflation narrative right that it, 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 they're they're fighting demands right they're trying to reduce aggregate demand by reducing the money supply right In theory that's that's what they're trying to do and so the question is what happens and this is where you know I think this is where we're heading personally in the next couple of years what happens if you are both reducing demand, but also supply is not, so the assumption is supply is steady state and you reduce demand, inflation goes down, right? That's, that's the economic theory anyway. What happens if supply is going down faster than the rate of demand destruction? 
right? Then you're still going to have inflation because the supply is just going lower and, and the Fed can't do anything. Central banks can't do anything to fix what is a, a you know part of a major cause of, of inflation, which is currently at least, is there's no, the supply chains are broken and there's no supply because of a number of other factors. And so if the supply by itself is not staying steady and you're reducing demand and, supply, and the supply rate is going down faster than your reduction of demand, you're still going to have inflation. And, right, and, the, and there will be there will be no explanation, I think, at that point for why inflation is still going up. And I think that's where we're heading in the next, you know, twelve. There, there will be there will be an explanation. Don't worry, they'll come up with something. So <laughs> a let's logical look, explanation. No logical explanation. Obviously, the only logical explanation is we know what it is. It's money supply increase. It all goes back to that. It's so simple and so obvious that you have to be massively overeducated, uh, maleducated, I should say, to borrow an Austrian term, in order to miss it. But let's look at the 1970s. You know, they came up with an equation. So the entire Keynesian scam relies on the idea that there is a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, that you can either have high inflation or high unemployment. And this is the founding, this is the logical inevitable consequence of the Keynesian framework. The Keynesian framework, as I was saying earlier, either you have high uh, aggregate expenditure or low aggregate expenditure. If you have high aggregate expenditure, you have l low unemployment but high inflation. If you have low aggregate expenditure, your aggregate expenditure is lower than your output, then you have high uh, unemployment and low inflation. So you can't get both high unemployment and high inflation. And also you cannot get high, uh, low unemployment and low inflation. According to the Keynesian model, this can't work. This is how it is. And this is, of course, why this entire thing, this entire thing is just so completely despicable as an intellectual exercise that it's not worth any kind of respect and why you can't respect anybody who practices this voodoo. Because if they had a shred of intellectual honesty, then all it would take is one example of one country sometime, somewhere, anywhere in the world that experiences low inflation and low unemployment or high inflation and high unemployment in order to disprove this model. Now, we don't just have one example. We have an infinite amount of examples. We basically don't have any country where you find this relationship holds. And this relationship is called the Phillips curve. The idea that if you plotted unemployment and inflation, one is going to be high. So the curve is going to be downward sloping curve where either you have low unemployment and inflation on one side or sorry, low unemployment and high inflation or low inflation and high unemployment. You can't have both and you can't have neither. But we have an endless amount of examples of both. If you look at Switzerland up until the 1960s and 70s, they had practically zero unemployment and practically zero inflation. They didn't have it. They were on the gold standard. And I have the chart in the Bitcoin standard. There's, there was no inflation in Switzerland in the 1960s practically or unemployment. And you look at the 1970s, all over the world, you had many countries that had an enormous amount of inflation along with an enormous amount of unemployment. So those two things are not compatible. You, you, if you have a shred of honesty, and you know the Keynesians claim to be empirical economists and they claim to be data-driven, it's complete nonsense. It's just like all of the COVID hysterics pretend to be data-driven uh, and, and that they, they um, supported all these insane totalitarian measures not in order to help their sponsors sell their products, but in order to actually help health. There's nothing about it as data-driven. If you were data-driven, you'd have the honesty to admit, well, look at the 1970s, we had high inflation, high unemployment. And this is where we're going right now as well. So uh, how do they explain it? Oh, there was a supply shock. This was the idea. So there was a supply shock that was caused by the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, which uh, led to an Arab oil embargo, which led to a shifting of the Phillips curve. So and this is just absolutely amazing that it works on anybody who's not a child is astonishing. Uh, this Phillips curve relationship still holds, but it shifted outward. And then when the supply shock subsided in the 1980s, the Phillips curve relationship still held, but it shifted backward. So then if you actually plot unemployment and inflation over the last 50 years, you don't get a Phillips curve. You just get a big blot of data where sometimes both are high, sometimes both are low, sometimes one is high and one is low, but there's nothing like a Phillips curve. You would think that this would destroy the idea of the Phillips curve, not to the Keynesians. 
The Phillips curve still holds, <laughs> but it is shifting because of supply shocks. And so the relationship is still, so they look at a blot of data of points all over the place, and they tell you, nope, the Phillips curve is still true. It's just that it goes back and forth. So you don't, you look at this and you just see a bunch of dots on a plot with no particular pattern. But if you're overeducated, then you can see that there, there are Phillips curves there. They're just shifting in and out. You're constantly looking at a whole group of different Phillips curves that are shifting in and out. So the explanation this time is going to obviously be, I mean, we already see it. It's the pandemic, it's the war. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be more, there's going to be more like uh, domestic, there'll be domestic pol explanations, you know, uh, this politician, this president or that president uh, will be made, uh, will be made a scapegoat, you know, it could well be blamed on Biden. Um, uh, Biden's stimulus or whatever is what shifted the Phillips curve outward. Um, so there is that, but I think in the 1970s, we had something similar, but I think the really interesting difference between now and the 1970s is debt levels. In the 1970s, you had high savings relatively. People still had savings. Now you don't have any savings. You don't have, uh, you, you just have very high debt levels. And so this for me is to go back to what you were saying in terms of uh, what Preston Pish's point, I think this is, this is really the kind of um, the, uh, the, the the reason that it might become very different this time around is that uh, yeah because there are no savings and because debt is very high you're going to get an enormous amount of bankruptcies you're going to get an enormous reduction in investment actual investment and by investment we don't mean the keynesian definition of investment of people building their own homes we mean actual investment in supply chains in productive enterprises that's what's going to collapse because a lot of businesses are going to go out of business because interest rates are rising. And um, everybody is heavily in debt. Um, in the 1970s, you know, people still had fresh memories of being on the gold standard relatively. So a lot of people had savings, few people had debt, and nowhere near as much debt levels as now. And so rising interest rates helped a lot of people who had money in the bank. And it, they didn't hurt as many people. And when I say people, I mean people in businesses. You know, a lot of businesses had cash assets on them. And so rising interest rates helped them. And so they could continue operating. So now, the big unknown is that everybody's in debt. Everybody has a mortgage to pay. Every business has a lot of um, liabilities to meet. And as interest rates rise, it could get really ugly. Yeah, and I, I mean, I... I try. I mean, you 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 mentioned something that really struck a chord with me. Is how does this work on anybody who's not a child? Is it's a mystery, and I you know, I I think about this a lot as I'm writing about um, the FOMC and the Federal Reserve and all these people that technically smart, right? Um, that should see through this as they're learning about it themselves and as they you know with any credibility look at it and honesty and, and try to assess it and i used to think and by the way for for those uh, who may not be familiar i have right now on coinbits dot, uh, at coinbits app i have the, the tweet thread that lists all our threads that i've done so far uh as, as a pinned tweet and you, you could go through them but i mean as, as i'm going through this as i'm reading the depth and the explanations and and um trying to simplify it for people with the 280 character threads. The thing that I always think about is, are these people ignorant? Are they just, you know, fiat educated, non-critical thinking people who are ignorantly trying to do the best they can? Or are they actually aware of what's happening and trying to, um, are they just bad people? Like, are they aware of it and the temptation to, continue to benefit from the money spigot and the closeness to the money supply too blinding and too much to overcome, which also is somewhat understandable. The answer I keep getting to over and over is while there are some people who are just pure ignorant, there is a level of, of bad actors in, in these institutions. I mean, here's the perfect example for this. So we, we were talking about the rising costs and we're talking about inflation and, and you know the the things that rise the most are the ones that are most closely related to government spending and most uh, influenced by government spending so you know the, the the famous chart of inflation where consumer goods and, and technology are kind of the lowest inflation rate and then as you get closer to government intervention um, food 
um, medical care, tuition. It, they're always at the highest levels. And in, in, in a presentation I put together to help orange pill some people, I was looking, I was, you know, showing this as a problem, showing, you know, the, the rise of tuition as a problem. There's a really interesting piece. I'll, I'll throw it in. Uh, I'll throw it in the chat. There's a really interesting piece of research by a <laughs> Federal Reserve Bank of New York staffer who is no longer a staffer. He's actually the vice president of, of research there. His name is, uh, his name is David Luca. And the title of the study, and this, this was uh, released in 2015 and revised in 2017, 59-page academic research where they look at the availability of credit supply and the rise in college tuition. And their conclusion is there is evidence that in the expansion of credits and expansion of money supply, it, there's a direct correlation and causation to the rise in tuition. This is someone who works at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This is the head of research there. Here's the link to the, to the actual paper. And so the idea that a part of the Federal Reserve, a big part of the Federal Reserve, arguably the most important part of the Federal Reserve, the head of research there publishes this paper. And this is not, this is not news. This is, you know, this is six, seven years old. And finds causation between the rise in college tuition, which every politician, every central banker says is a problem. We need to make education more tenable for people. And they find that there's a direct correlation between the expansion, expansion of credits and tuition going up. Yet nothing, nothing is being done about it. No one's talking about it. There's no call by David Luca or any of his colleagues who put together this research to abolish the Federal Reserve. There is... You can't you can't have it both ways. You can't say yes, expanding the money supply causes t college tuition to rise, and by the way, we need to you know lower college tuition and we need to make education more affordable for people. You can't say both things and not be a complete bad actor. I, I'm sorry, there's no explanation for it, and so it's it's really remarkable that people can have these two faces, and and you know <laughs> life continues as as has as had been. It's it's crazy. You know, people people need to pay their bills, and uh, the way that you pay the, your bills is that you um, go along with this. It, it's it's untenable to go against this if you want to keep your career. Um, somebody attributes this to Paul Krugman once. Um, I'm not sure how true this is, but somebody who was a um, a colleague of Paul Krugman when he had, he was at university. I'm not sure if it was an undergraduate or a graduate student. But some kind of somebody made a criticism of the Federal Reserve, and Krugman told them, uh, "Look, if you want to succeed as an economist, you don't say that." And I think that's very true. Like it's just, um, and 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 like at the highest levels of any kind of whether it's, this is true or not, I think whether the actual quote by Krugman is true or not, I don't. I think is uh, uh, whether he said it or not does not change the fact that it is true. At the highest levels, you know, if you want to make it as an NBA athlete, if you want to make it as a, a musician. It requires an enormous amount of focus and dedication on your mission. It requires a kind of um, bloody mindedness and singular focus where you have to subdue everything else in order to make it. And I knew some of these people in graduate school and you see them in every field. Like if you want to, if you're going to make it as a boxer, as a soccer player, as a musician, as an artist, whatever it is that you're going to be doing, if you want to make it to to the top, you can't make it to the top by just being an ordinary person and living an ordinary life and then practicing for a couple of hours a day. You you can't become the best basketball player in the world. You can't make it to the NBA if you don't live basketball every day of your life from when you're a child like you have to just be completely focused because a lot of people play basketball you know and uh, a lot of very talented kids are playing basketball today in fact um, you know a lot of talented 15 year olds uh, if you look around at 15 year olds playing soccer today um, the most talented ones, the best ones, are not necessarily the ones that are going to make it. Um, some of the most talented players at age 17, 18, even at the early pay stages of the professional career, you know, there'll be 20 year old players who just don't make it because of the mentality thing. They can't listen to the coach, they can't be focused, they're too busy partying, they get their first paycheck and they blow it all on. Uh, drinks and uh, dating women and partying and driving flashy cars 
and um, by age 24 they can't make it into uh anything they can't make it into uh you know they, they retire at 24 they can't even get into any professional team at 24 because they've ruined themselves so it requires an enormous amount of focus in order to succeed in any of those things and so any economist that you see at the top level you know and the, whether it's krugman or any of those people if they've managed to make it to that level at the top universities, and by top, I mean bottom worst universities, um, if they've managed to make it there, if they managed to get to the top uh, journals published in these places, it, it's not just about um, you know, doing work. It's not just about being good at math. <laughs> Obviously, uh, there are a lot of people that are much better at math than all economists. Basically, econo um, the math in economics is mediocre. Uh, it's it, it's it, they're basically failed physicists and statisticians. Um, you don't need to be good at math in order to be a good economist. You need to just completely make central banking and Keynesian economics your mission, and you need to have a very 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 uh, tunnel vision focus on this objective and that whether it's you know in in the same way for the football player like you have to be at 18 when you make your first contract and you make money and all of your friends want you to go out and party with them you need to focus on your game you need to be sitting at home watching other teams watching your opponents finding out what to do doing what your coach tells you going to bed early eating properly it's an enormous amount of focus and it requires an element of an echo chamber. Like I've heard this from several people that uh, work with athletes. All these top athletes live in perfectly controlled echo chambers. They don't just go around uh, talking to people. Like if you notice, very few top athletes will engage on social media. It's not healthy for them to engage with people that are calling them idiots because they missed the goal or they uh, missed the basket. It's not healthy for your focus to to have to consider the idea maybe you're not cut out you're not good enough for this team maybe you should go and play in another league you should not entertain that thought in order for you to be able to turn up every game and do the best that you can you need to have full conviction and this is how i think of these people in in, in economics it's just i remember when i was in grad school and i started to get these heretic ideas i try and talk to some people and it's it's, it's extremely uncomfortable. It makes them extremely uncomfortable and they just want to end the conversation. They don't want to even answer you. They're just, um, I don't care, basically. Like, uh, it's, it's like going to a professional athlete and telling him, hey, you know, maybe you're not cut out for soccer. Maybe you shouldn't be a soccer player. Maybe you shouldn't be a defender. Maybe you should be a striker. Maybe you should go and try and be a goalkeeper. You, they shouldn't listen to those ideas. They have to be focused on what they do they need to be a defender and in this case you have to be focused on promoting keynesian inflationism this is what the job is this is the job description and so you know whether you are aware of the implications of it or not i think you need to not be aware of them you need to convince yourself that you're not aware that you're doing a bad thing you need to convince yourself that you're doing a good thing and anytime you come across an uncomfortable conclusion you swipe it under the carpet and you forget about it and um, you just continue to uh, channel the right uh, message and uh, you know if you don't do it it doesn't matter and then you just fall off the wayside you know just like in uh, soccer for every superstar that you see for every premier league player that you see for every player who makes it into the premier league there's a hundred kids who were his uh, friends and they were as good as him when they were 15 and they couldn't make it because you know one of them got drunk before a big game when they were 16 uh, another one uh, was too focused on something else another one had problems at home someone had a breakup with their girlfriend another one didn't watch their diet and um, so many will fall on the wayside <laughs> there's a giant conveyor belt of new talent coming through every day that there will always be players to fill up the Premier League and perform um, at the top. And it's the same with economists. And they, they just have to turn up and do this job. And again, because it is fiat, there's no test, the real market test. This is ultimately the kind of driving point in, in the fiat standard that none of these things have a real market test. You don't get to go out in the real world and test your ideas against um, 
I guess whether they work or not, it's just can you get central bank funded money printer grants? That's what it comes down to. Yeah, and it's you, everything that you just described reminds me of the, George or Orwell's uh, 1984, and I think the the you know there's so many quotes there that can be related to this. I think the one that resonates the most with me is history has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right, and it yeah the you know you either you you're along with the mainstream narrative you're supporting the system that currently exists or you fall by the wayside because you just you can't get close enough to the money spigot to to, to earn a living to to do anything that uh, you know get, gets you a paycheck and it's and it's sad and that's why Bitcoin wins and you know it's a double edged sword as sad as it is the fact that Bitcoin exists and the fact that we now have an opt-out of that clown world system in which there is a real market test to your point in which there has to be production before consumption i mean it's a very basic concept right like the, the entire keynesian model falls apart as soon as you recognize the truth that on this planet in this lifetime anyway you have to produce before you consume there is no getting around that an idea that you can trigger production by increasing consumption is as backwards as it gets and as soon as people start to see that truth and recognize that that's how life works that's you know the, the laws of thermodynamics the laws of the universe that we we live in that's how things work you begin to open up to understanding bitcoin and you begin to understand that you know this this is the way that things should be and i think what we're getting towards and and you know it's, it's like that uh you know that meme with the, the two pathways where you have like the doom and gloom on one side with the fiat system and then bitcoin and it's like you know it, it leads to a, a, ha a happy ending we're getting very close to that i think in in, in you know in human history where you can have um freedom that is dangerous or you can have safe slavery. And Bitcoin is forcing that choice to everybody who, who is approaching it. And you can continue to agree with the party from 1984 and live in that world, or you can choose the dangerous freedom route and be, um, you know, reap the consequences of your actions, whether you produce or not, whether you are valuable to your fellow humans or not, and partake of those consequences, whether good or bad, and everybody will be the better for it. Or you can join the safe slavery route in which you are nothing but a cog in the wheel of you know, the, the Keynesian mindset, which enriches, uh, enriches those who are at the top at the expense of everybody else. Indeed, indeed. All right, uh, which other thread do you wanna to go to? Do you wanna to go to those uh, and the rest of them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the the theme that I'm trying to, to highlight again with these threads for those who join late, the idea is the best way to orange pill people, the best way to get people to realize what Bitcoin presents is just showcasing, just like the fiat standard does, showcasing all the endless clown world system aspects that we live in today. And so that's the theme. So whether it's CPI or the FOMC or the Federal Reserve and how that came about or the history, and this is another rich one, the history of the CPI changes. Um, all those are meant to help open people's minds to how broken the current system is. And, and that's, you know, we're trying to meet people where they are, both on, on Twitter and obviously with the apps of CoinBits uh, is, is meant to allow to, the, 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 we're, we're trying to build the most user-friendly experience, people, you know, experiences that people are familiar with, with uh, you know, online banking to get on Coinbase. So that's, that's the entire goal. That's the inspiration. So for, you know, for the Federal Reserve, for the FOMC threads, I mean, um, it, it, <laughs> the entire, maybe the best one to start with is the history of, of how the Federal Reserve was, uh, was created. And the, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913. And, and one of the, maybe we start with this one, the, the Oversight Committee, uh, the Financial Stability Oversight Committee. Let me uh, let me pull that up here real quick. They didn't exist until um, until later on. So that you know, the Federal Reserve exists, and then eventually, the uh, the you know this FOMC committee where um, they they essentially look at stability and you know <laughs> stability in in financial markets as a measure for how they're performing, how they're doing their job. First of all. You know, the last couple of years have shown 
that they're currently not doing their job, yet the committee continues to exist. But let's just say that, again, steel manning all these arguments, let's just say that there is a place for them. What, is, what does this actually look like? So they have two, um, two you know, basically two, um, two things they try to do is, is maintain financial stability, that's the Federal Reserve as a whole, and, uh, and, and monitor employment uh, rates and, and keep full employment, which is also nonsensical, but just on the financial stability side. So here's how the Fed defines financial stability. Uh, you, so many red flags here, but they say when financial institutions and markets are able to provide to communities and businesses products they need to invest, grow, and participate in a well-functioning economy. That is what they call financial stability. In other words, it's the financial stability, not of the people, but of the financial institutions who then provide, like a, a, an implicit in that in that definition is you need financial institutions to provide products for the economy to grow and for everybody to, you know, to, to stay alive, which is so many falsehoods there. But let's just go, go with it and say that that's real and that's feasible. They then are referring specifically to financial intermediaries of all shapes and sizes. And they basically say that any disruption to the functioning of these intermediaries between borrowers and lenders, because in, you know, in their mind, in their world, that is the economy, borrowers and lenders, can carry a very high price if there's disruption. Where are we now, right? We, we have disruption in every market, every treasury market in the world, the US included, whether we, whether we admit it or not. And so we already have disruption there now. So even if this entire system was true and logical, what we have today is financial instability. Yet nobody's talking about it. There's nobody, you know, nobody has lost their job at the Financial Oversight Committee for the financial instability that we have today in the world markets, assuming that that's even a possible or desirable thing. I mean, volatility is information, and that's another entire rabbit hole where you need to have price fluctuations at the point of a price is you need to see what desirable goods people want to make more of it. It's an economic signal, but we're trying to quiet down that signal to get financial stability, which they don't even define that way. They say it's, you know, is there enough borrowing and lending going on? And is it the right balance and aggregates? It was also backwards, but even then that's not even true today. And so why, why, why aren't anybody on a financial oversight committee fired? Like we don't have financial stability of the world over. And it comes down to, well, you know, fiat explanation and, and, you know, a whole, whole list of things. And so they, they look at four components and I'll, I'll summarize with this. They look at four components to quantify financial stability, which is a nonsensical concept to begin with, but they look at asset valuation and risk appetites. Where are we today? That's tanking. They look at financial system leverage. Where are we today? Where every dollar is, you know, 75 X leveraged as I think, uh, uh, Parker Lewis always likes to say, where every dollar is, is, is leveraged 75 times, insanity. They look at funding risk, which with the rising rates of the past few months, risks are extremely high, and they've been at the highest levels since the great financial crisis. And they look at borrowing by businesses and households, which are also coincidentally at all times highs. And so each one of these currently in the current system, if this oversight committee had any control none of these risk components would be where they are today. So even if they should exist, even if we go along with the narrative that they actually provide financial stability and they have control over it, they're not doing their job now, yet they all keep their jobs. It's, it's, it's insane. Yeah, and I think the key point here is that the financial instability is not something you want to repress. It's it's the cleansing. It's like uh, we. It's like if you're if you've eaten something bad, you'll vomit, and we're out there trying to eliminate vomiting. Obviously, you don't want to vomit because you don't want to eat anything bad. But if you've eaten something bad, vomiting is how your body gets rid of it. So uh, this notion that let's suppress financial stabi financial instability, let's get rid of the volatility, is is pretty insane because you're just trying to say let's let's get rid of the symptoms while continuing to eat the poison. You know, if we manage to find a way to kill the vomits, then uh, the poisonous food suddenly becomes good. 
and uh, you know one common objection that you get to uh, um, these ideas when you tell people, yeah, no, governments shouldn't be out there bailing out uh, financial institutions. Like, well, then they would collapse, and then you would have a collapse. Exactly, yes, they would collapse. That would be the end of it, and then people will learn not to do this insane stuff. But uh, of course, that can't be <laughs> done because it's. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, this is, the, the entire system works to the benefit of the organizations that uh, own it and that benefit from it. And so they are not in the business of free market competition. They don't like the idea of free market competition. If we just simply had free market competition in money and banking, then well, none of this stuff would exist. All of these bad practices would be wiped out. All of the instability would just be wiped out immediately. Yeah, and even 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 using their terms, right? So they they look specifically. I think the one that is resonates most most with me because I am one of these people, right? So actually, I've, I've been going the opposite ever since I just, I did this thread. But they say if credit exposure in households and non financial businesses is high, borrowers often curtain spending and disengage from economic activity, and the the reason that's usually cited of why we aren't currently in a recession in the US is that people are still spending and nobody's unemployed yet. And so we're, everything is fine. We're not in a technical recession, even though technically we are. But even if that were like spending consumer loans and credit cards and revolving plans of all consumers and com at commercial banks is at a rate that hasn't, it, it's at all time highs. Like we exceeded where we are today in terms of credit, people taking on credit and, and, that is not a sign of a healthy economy, even if things, even if you didn't have supply problems, even if there wasn't a, a, a war going on. That That is the fact that people have to spend at the level that they are in the midst of rates increases where credit is becoming more expensive, yet we're still taking on more credit. And that that is, even if you believe the Keynesian nonsense, even if you believe that the system is, is true and is necessary, there's a problem, and and it it's it's going to end badly. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think people who can see through it and people who can, you know, dollar cost average, don't over lever yourself, and uh, you know, and and are able to make it to the other side are going to benefit greatly from just having seen it. And the question is when, not if. Yeah. So that brings us nicely to Coinbits. We should have maybe spoken about this earlier, but tell us more about uh, Coinbits. What do you guys do at Coinbits? Wow. Yeah, How so, are you fixing this? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, so Coin, Coinbits uh, was started by a couple of brothers uh, in, in the 2017 cycle. And the idea was very simple. The idea was how do we make Bitcoin attainable for everybody? How do we make Bitcoin available to the grandmas of the world, right? People who maybe have online banking, who maybe have heard of Bitcoin, maybe want to not be on the wrong side of that trade should you know should bitcoin um, go to the moon which we know it will and just want to get some very simple exposure to it and so the idea was at the time how do we make it super simple and super easy for people to to get on board and that, that carries through to our product today and the model that was chosen at the time was to basically be acorns for bitcoin and acorns if you're not familiar is just a simple way to roll up your change round up your change um, and invest it for you. Now, instead of investing in stocks, bonds, those traditional financial markets, it's Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. And so it's a very simple product, and uh, and and a lot of people uh, basically grew their piggy banks over time, where you know their their cup of coffee and twenty cent change added up over time as Bitcoin's price appreciates, number go up. Uh, those piggy banks became bigger and bigger, and so the the product offering now is turning into like all this, you know, all all these people who have benefited from number go up just simply by dollar cost averaging their Spain change and and turning their high time preference spending into into a savings mechanism uh you know the, what do we do now what's next how do we make this uh and how do we make this uh work for us and so that's what we're building now we're trying to bridge the gap between the hyper bitcoinized world where bitcoin is the de facto spending currency and, and only money in the world. And right now in, in fiat world where, you know, you need dollar liquidity. And so that, that's what we're building for. And we have a variety of products and product offerings to to do that. Now, the key thing that I think sets Coinbits apart from any other 
DC, DCA application and there are many. And as long as you're DCA and as long as you're getting exposure to Bitcoin and withdrawing and getting rid of third party risk by holding on to your own keys and running your own node um, that sets us apart is we are building for everybody right now most and it's gone a long way right and most most exchanges have have come you know have, have, have improved over the past four years ever since i've been into bitcoin anyway but it used to be very difficult um and arguably um many exchanges today even bitcoin only exchanges are still there's still some friction between the kyc and um, you know how to do different things and the, the, just the idea of uploading your id and stuff like all that stuff is very um frictional and what we try to do at coinbits is make it as you know, as, as limited friction as possible, given the regulations and the things that we have to abide by. And so that's, I think, what we strive to do is the user experience and the product team and design team that we, you know, we've, uh, we've built up are really, really good at is building experiences that people can fall in love with, that people can, um, you know, as, as, uh, as limited friction as possible and, and really just make it available, available and an easy onboard for everybody. Yes. Yeah, and it's 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 a very good idea. I think the uh, the thing that will appeal to Bitcoiners about Coinbits is that uh, uh, you know everybody gets into Bitcoin and then they immediately start lowering their time preference, as we've documented um, repeatedly uh, in this podcast and in my book, and I think in the private personal experience of many many people, we see this over and over again, and. Uh, I think Coinbase is a great way to do that. That is why I really like the product because um, you're stacking sats for every time that you spend money. And so the more you spend, the more you stack. It's a way to uh, basically make your high time preference uh, <laughs> work in the favor of your future self. Um, it's, uh, it's a way to short circuit your time preference because uh, every time that you're spending money, you're taking a little bit of change and you're adding it to your future. So if any time you are being high time preference you know you're taking away some money from today and stashing it away in uh acorn for tomorrow basically which i think is very good and these things add up it's uh initially i think people are very skeptical of the idea that that's eh, just change but you know most people make so many purchases every day they use their credit card so many times that uh yeah just a little bit of change every day consistently while uh being uh uh, while um, being put into Bitcoin over time, they add up very well. Yeah, ex exactly. And I think the nice thing about about uh, the product offering too is that you're able to actually, in in bear markets like this, and you know, let's say you want to increase your DCA, but you don't know necessarily how much. Well, you don't even have to. We have a great DCA product that's called Saving Habits, um, which which is a it's a great way for you know the the more the more you get into Bitcoin, the more that you want to set that up, but. Even if you're just using the roundup feature, the nice thing about it is, let's say we're in a bear market, which we've been in for months now, you can actually increase your DCA by just picking a multiplier. So you can go to 2x, 5x, 10x your normal roundup, where let's say your spare change for the week adds up to, I don't know, 6 or $7. You can actually 10x that in bear markets and you can turn that off you know, whenever you feel like it, where instead of now the $6, you're actually supplementing and trying to uh, bring your cost average lower over time by buying more when you know when when price action is on the downside and you know this we're, we're in this for you know for the long term we're not building for we're not building for the hype we're not building for for people who want to you know be in and out we're not building for traders that's not what we're trying to do we're trying to build for the low time preference individual people who want to become low time preference but actually can't and, and you know, all of us in different aspects of life are there right like you want to do something better but you know life gets in a way and you maybe don't have discipline Coinbits forces a discipline with your bitcoin strategy that's that's a nice thing exactly don't trust yourself just uh you know verify <laughs> yes yes exactly <laughs> well there was another piece that you'd written a uh, long time ago on your spiritual uh journey with bitcoin and you know, the spiritual implication of bitcoin this is something that's it's a very common thing we get a lot of people um who've discussed this we've hosted jimmy song on here before he spoke about the book that he co-authored which is uh, thank god for bitcoin and we've also had several episodes where uh, we had Muslims explain their perspective on uh, why they view Bitcoin as being uh, much more compatible with Islamic law and Islamic Sharia 
than fiat money. Give us a little bit of a summary of your perspective on that. What is it that draws you as a religious and spiritual person into into Bitcoin? Yeah, and I, I thank you for bringing this up, Safe. I think uh, it's so the, the book, Thank God for Bitcoin, whether you are Christian or Muslim or Hindu or whatever other religious affiliation you might have is definitely a must read. Highly recommend it. Um, I actually started to write my essay um, prior to the publication of that book. And then the book came out as I was getting ready to publish. And I said, okay, hold on. I, I got to read this book so that it's, it's you know, there's you know, I'm not repeating anything they say, and I'm adding and and uh, and not subtracting from the message that they send, which is is an awesome book. I use it quite frequently for anybody who maybe uh, the best way to orange pill them. And this is again another theme here is you have to meet people where they are. Sometimes this angle uh, resonates with a lot of people. As a matter of fact, um, my wife when I when I shared this essay with her. She started all of a sudden. She's not completely orange pilled yet. She's she's in her journey. But this resonated with her a lot when I brought up uh, when I brought up uh, Bitcoin from a uh, Christian lens. And so, um, I think that the you know the inspiration behind this is you you know you you Google Bitcoin and Christianity, or you Google Bitcoin and and try to see what uh, prominent um, outspoken Christian financial experts would uh, experts um, mention uh, you get the David Ramsey's of the world and, and people who are completely fiat minded and haven't done their due diligence. And so what I wanted to do with this essay is essentially highlight for people who might, um, you know, be misguided by some of the angles on Bitcoin from a Christian perspective and why actually it is uh, in complete alignment with Christianity. And I think so it's, and it's a 20 minute read. It's, it's, a, it's a long essay, but I, I tried to make it as um, impactful as possible and looking at Bitcoin specifically from the lens of what the Bible teaches about money. And the TLDR there is basically um, Bitcoin is the most ultimate form of low time preference, both in action and from a monetary and economic perspective. And it encourages more low time preference activity, which is exactly what the Bible teaches to do, if, if you were to kind of summarize at high level. So the Bible is, um, is basically a book, I think, ultimately about how to um, live in a, in a way that is a low time preference way amongst, you know, a, a, variety, a, a varying, uh, you know, angles of, of life and, and what to do and, and saving and, and, and building for the future and, and um, making sure you create value for others and that your effort is is meaningful for your fellow human beings and all of that. And Bitcoin is the only tool that we have today that this decouples us from fiat world that forces high time preference. And I think Jimmy Song summarizes this, this very well, where he says, um, you can't, in, in, a, in a fiat world, you can't not be a slave to money. And, you know, there's a, bi a famous Bible verse that says you cannot... Um, you know, you cannot worship God and, and mammon, mammon sometimes referring to, to money. And in, in fiat world today, your entire life revolves around making more fiat so that you can provide for your family. And so you can't escape. And so that aspect of being able to, you know, pull yourself apart from fiat world and start to live a low time preference life, which Bitcoin and many people have spoken about this, forces you into and just it, it it opens your eyes to it is the perfect Christian money in that sense. It is perfectly biblical and it's aligned perfectly with what the Bible talks about um, for money, for uh, effort, for labor, for time, for, you know, all, all those things that are associated with money. And, and the piece is basically a deep dive into that. Excellent. Yeah, we're definitely included in the show notes as well. I encourage people to look it up. It is a very thoughtful piece. Um, well, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us, Ruiz. It's uh, always a pleasure to be chatting to you. And uh, I encourage people to check out Twitter account, Coinbits app, and check out your Twitter spaces. You hold the court on Twitter every Friday at um, around, I think it is uh, noon Eastern. or No, it's it, 2 p.m. It, Eastern. It, it varies, yeah. Usually 2 p.m. Eastern. It's Bitcoin and chill Fridays. We try to kind of, uh, you know, 
kick people off into the weekend. We we need some good Bitcoin energy heading into the weekend. So join us. Safe uh, frequently joins us uh, if he's able, and uh, we usually have a guest speaker. If not, it's just the Coinbits team hanging out, chilling, talking about the news of the week. Which, you know, by the way, if you if you aren't able to keep up with all the Bitcoin news, and now it's impossible. Like it used to be about a year ago, where you know you you. You know, you go on Twitter twice a month and or twice a week, and you're able to catch up with all the Bitcoin news. Now, like you, you could be on Bit, you know, on Bitcoin Twitter, you know, three times a day, and you're still not able to keep up with everything. So, um, we try to summarize all those things in a in a weekly newsletter, which uh, the 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 link to that is uh, is on our Coinbits app uh, Twitter handle. Uh, subscribe. It's a five minute read. Comes out Thursday afternoons, and we usually, uh, if we don't have a guest speaker or a specific topic, we usually will dive into it on on Friday afternoons and just highlight the the news of the week for everybody. So, we'd love to have you guys as regular listeners and uh, and uh, readers of our newsletter. Excellent. Um, anything else you want us to show? Oh, there's the blog as well, the Coinbase blog. Yes, yes. Uh, so the the Coinbase blog sometimes is uh, you know is, is we we deep dive into topics that are that are um, pertinent to Bitcoiners or or uh, you know a compilation of both learning and and basically our take on as Bitcoiners on the different things like for example athletes was was one that we published in February uh, Bitcoin being freedom money uh, Bitcoin decoupling money from state there's a lot of interesting thought pieces on that and uh, they're usually very insightful and, and helpful and a really good way to orange pill your friends and family right so maybe the angle and again the theme here is how do you reach people where they are maybe someone is very interested in politics and um you know they are still in the two-party system and you want to snap them out of it from a bitcoin lens without being overly uh subscriptive on bitcoin that's that's what the blog is for it's it's really helpful articles to share with friends and family to uh to help them get different angles of bitcoin and uh and we we spend a lot of effort on making those readable and and enjoyable for all audiences not just bitcoiners and that's uh again that's the, the angle we're taking excellent fantastic thank you so much for joining us again and uh i'll catch up with you on uh bitcoin and chill fridays sometime soon Awesome, fantastic! Thank you so much for having me, Safe. And uh, can I say this is a this is a pinch myself moment? I can't believe uh, you know having read the Bitcoin standards, uh, you know, almost uh, four and a half years ago now, that I would be speaking to the person about it that uh, that have you know honestly changed my life forever. And, and to that, I owe you a debt of gratitude. So thank thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good right, day. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thank you.